Welcome to The Fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rido, joined as always by my friend and legendary boxing commentator and trainer, the great Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? Good, Ken. Good, good. Um, oh, you... How you doing? Did you found the fountain of youth? You get younger every time I see you. <laughs> I get happy. I get happy and uh, relaxed when I, on Monday morning. I love talking to you. This is like the highlight of my week in life. <laughs> I get to do something I love. Can you imagine to the people watching? I'm sure they can relate. Imagine getting to talk about boxing and, and MMA fighting every single Monday with Teddy Atlas and people actually pay attention. It's like a dream come true. It's well, given guys, me some of the greatest gifts in my life. Uh, well, that's nice. I appreciate it. You know, how's the training going for your Tokyo Marathon? Because uh, I know the people would like to know because you're the Marathon King, uh, Masters Champion, and Tokyo, I mean, Tokyo, it's it's big. Um, yeah. What, what, so how's the training? Everything, everything is going great. I, um, I don't know. I feel like I'm fitter than ever. I would have liked to have run faster at that Clearwater Half Marathon last week. But, you know, when you do those races in the middle of huge training blocks, it's hard to be your sharpest and, and yeah. really, like, razor sharp. So, uh, but, yeah, I'm getting huge volumes in, 90 to 100 miles almost every week uh, for the last wow. eight weeks. And I've got uh, really two hard weeks of training left. The race is in four weeks. I leave three weeks. I leave in three weeks for Tokyo and then, you know, a week taking it easy, just jogging in Tokyo to prepare for the uh, race on March 5th. But yeah, I'm super excited. How and, long do uh, you get there before to acclimate? I'm going to get there seven days before. Is that enough? I mean, I mean, not in a perfect world, but I'm not. A, <laughs> I don't. That's not how I make a living. So if I, if, if if I were a professional runner, I'd probably give myself two weeks. But yeah. I think that seven weeks is like a reasonable, um, yeah, a reasonable you know meet you in the middle type agreement instead of being there for let's say 14 days seven yeah, days plus, would be enough yeah plus it keeps you from getting divorced too i mean that's, that's <laughs> exactly <laughs> you have the I'm best lucky wife in that department. you got the my best wife, wife in the yeah. world i mean she's super supportive of this stuff honestly love, yeah. and my kids are too they um, your kids too yeah they know this is we, it's the true of everyone, man. You know how it is. Even when you were training fighters for years, I know you missed a lot of stuff that you wouldn't want to miss, but they also know okay. that for you to be the best with your family, you have to do what's, you know, what's what's calling you. And, and it's not, I know we like to think everything's about your kids and abandon all other interests, but that's not realistic. For you to be the best, you have to be fulfilled in all areas of your life. And luckily my family understands that and knows that, I can give them a better version of myself if I'm also taking care of the things that are important to me personally, too. Well, you're teaching them, too, along the way, as a father should always be teaching, right? You teach yep. them to go after what you, you know, go after what you love and, and to, yeah. you know, go after your, your des you know, chase your dreams, chase your desires with hard work and um, dedication and don't allow it, obviously, to disrupt what, it's most important in your life which is being a father and a husband and everything else but find a way to do it find a way yeah. to do those things too and um That's right. and to teach them as you're teaching them to teach them you know dedication uh commitment those are lessons that <laughs> they have to be taught somewhere yeah yeah no they see that every day the a couple two weeks ago it was pouring rain and cold and i went out and run and and uh, my wife said are you going to go out and run in this weather? And my daughter said, Mom, he runs every single day. He, of course he's going to go out and run in the rain. And I was like, Tensei, you're learning. You cannot fake your way through this stuff. If you want to be good, you have to suffer. All Same the, like, thing as when they have a job. Let's just say your yeah. kids have a job. I know one of them is a jujitsu master, but um, if they, <laughs> uh, <laughs> they want to, uh, they're going to wake up one day and they're not going to feel too damn good but they're going to still have to go to work they're still going to have to take care of whatever their responsibility is that they or they won't and if That's they don't it. then they get on the other pile the pile of people that are not successful but if they want to be on a pile that's successful to the right you know then guess what they will get up and they will despite being sick despite not feeling like it they will get the work done and get it done at a high level so that's the truth it's it's easy to say to your kids like oh you could be anything you want to be you could do this you can do that and 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 if you're not doing something great yourself it's easy for your kids to look at you and be like why didn't you do that then <laughs> why do you seem unhappy going to the same job all the time i don't want my kids to do that i i i 
at least once a week, I'll say to my wife and my kids, like, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I get to do things that I really like to do, but it didn't, didn't happen overnight. I was in my mid forties before it started to click. So, you know, you just have to like, whatever you're doing, you have to do 110%. Because even if you're working with colleagues, you don't like those people, you're going to cross paths with some of these people again in life. And they're going to remember the kind of character that you show. How, do you show up and complain? Or do you show up and just handle your damn business like a professional? And eventually that that reputation catches up with you for better or worse. In my case, it was for the better. And look at the opportunities it's provided me. It's yeah, you know, they had that commercial. You see those commercials. You're making me think. You see those commercials where they say, you know, going to a, a game with your kid, you know, uh, $200 for the tickets, uh, yeah. $50 for parking, uh, you know, $4,000 for hot dogs, you know, whatever they, <laughs> I mean, you know, nowadays. Uh, but at the end of the day, the price priceless right it's uh, yeah. that the time with what a, the memories with your, the memories the time would you get priceless well you know it, it's the same it's the same thing when you know when you talk about uh the the things that you're just talking about right now uh you know responsibility being able to teach these things you know uh it's it's priceless it's yeah. i mean you, you know uh no matter what uh, at the end of the day, these are lessons, these are attributes that to be successful, we talked about it off the air earlier, that having these attributes like reliability, you know, consistency, respons being responsible, all those things, those are the lifeblood of success. I mean, you know, and it's it's not taught enough and to learn those things, it's priceless. You know, it, I mean, if people knew later on what they, you know, if they knew it early in their life, could you imagine the money they would pay to be able to go to a class, to be able to go get something that they could take a pill if there was such a thing that yep. could get them up to speed in those areas in those abilities that get overlooked everybody looks at you know how quick you run the 40 how much weight yeah. that you can put on the bar to press in your gym you know all those things how high you can jump the long jump the the the, the horizontal jump this that but how about how dependable you can be the ones i talk about for my whole life i've been talking about this in my sport and we talk about it on this podcast all the time about the quiet talents not the neon ones not the ones that everybody sees that light up you know uh, that everybody chases after but how about the ones that are more silent the ones that you're talking about right now you know the abilities to do something you don't feel like doing it you know being able to be that resilient being able to be that dependable when it's hard to be dependable those talents are the talents that quite frankly they create millionaires. They create billionaires. They they create just regular successful people. Fathers, mothers, you know, husbands, wives. I mean, without those attributes, without those abilities, uh, you know, we'd have a lot less successful people in this world. Um, you know, most of the people don't have those neon talents that we talk about. But they, everybody, everybody can have the talents I'm talking about right now about being dependent. All that, all that takes is wanting to, wanting to get yourself strong in those areas. Going out yeah, the there difficult, and the difficult doing thing it. is everyone sees the end result. Like they see you on ESPN and they're like, I want to be like that. I'm a boxing trainer. Why? They don't know the seven years up in the cat skills in complete anonymity and darkness, not knowing where it's going to lead. And to a lesser extent, with my running, people will ask me running questions. I'm like, how, how do I get faster? I said, I don't know. I spent f at least five years running 10 miles a day in complete anonymity, in the dark, in the rain, every single day, never missed a day. Unless I was deathly sick, I show up. 
But no one wants to know that. They just want to know, I just want to skip the bullshit and get to the end. I want to have what, I want to have the win, not the work. And I did a run yesterday. I did, I did a hard 13 mile run at like a 545 average pace on Saturday. And yesterday I ran 22 miles at 634 pace. And at, in the description of the run, I wrote, the races are won and lost so many weeks in advance of the race. The race day is literally like a beauty contest. It's like, hey, look at what I've been doing when you weren't watching. Watch how fast I cover this course. It's not about that day I showed up and I was magic. I want everything to click that day, but there's no freaking way that I can run like that if I haven't spent 12 weeks suffering like a dog by myself in the rain, in the freaking cold, minus 13 wind chill on, on Friday of last week, snowing, dark, 5.30 in the morning. No one sees that unless I share it on social media. But the point is no one's asking me, hey, are you running tomorrow? And no one cares if I do it or not. I'm the only one that cares. But that's, you can't fake your way through it. And, and the best thing is it's free. Anyone can do this. I'm not, I'm not a good runner. I'm just working harder than other people. And, and anyone, anyone can, can do exactly that. Well, uh, hard work. And that's anybody, anybody could develop the talents, the real talents, the real attributes that go around this, that make this possible. Anyone can go and find them. I used to tell the New York Jets when for three years I was listed as a coach, you know. I was the head coach. I like to joke. I was going to say, not coach. listed. You were a coach. I joke. I say I was the head coach. You were the head coach <laughs> of the Jets? Yeah, this, the mind, the cerebral <laughs> part. You know, that part. Not not the part where you get a pay stub that actually gives you three million a year or whatever um, and says <laughs> you're the head coach. But, three million? You'd be on discount if you were making three, uh, well, only three million in the well, NFL. nowadays, yeah, nowadays you're right. But I'm going back a lot of years. And, <laughs> y you know, I, I'd still, three million, I would probably say yes to three million. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I think that would be fair. I wouldn't start complaining about that uh for three million i'd coach the team in uh kabul afghanistan yeah uh, with uh with a <laughs> rifle next to you but um i i would tell the the players i was gonna say kids shows you how old i'm getting but i would tell the players the young players i would say listen these attributes we already know that you're fast we know you're strong we know but these other attributes they're the most important attributes they're the most important talents that you have to do and here's the good thing is it doesn't matter who your parents were it doesn't matter what your genetic pool was you know uh as far as having these talents they're they're available to everybody there's a great super red shopping center where you can go into you bring your cart you know you bring your shopping cart and you go down the aisles and you can pick up all that stuff you need oh go down the aisle with discipline go throw some of that in go down the aisle with resiliency throw some go down the aisle with determination throw some of that in there go down there down the aisle that uh tells you about dependability throw some of that in there it's, it's you know, it's available to everybody. Everyone could develop. Everybody could go and claim these these attributes and take them and grab them and put them to use and start developing them. So anyway, that's our life lesson for the day, um, <laughs> you know, that we like to do here at Dr. Atlas's and uh, Ken Rideout's. Uh, the Super Bowl is coming up. Uh, we will have a Super Bowl champ the next time we go on the air. Eagles oh, and yep, Chiefs. That's a good point. So we have to get a pick. I'm going to real quickly say that, first of all, the two weeks off. I I go back far enough where they didn't get two weeks off, Ken. I remember when they only got a week off. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure the Chiefs are very thankful that they got two weeks off. Because, oh, hell yeah. <laughs> you know, they were, yeah, they were banged up. They had no wide receivers left. Their quarterbacks all banged up. So they really needed, they needed the full two weeks off. Um, I don't know if it's going to give them everything back they need, but also their their coach Andy Reid has a damn good track record coming off that extra week with the bye week. I know Belichick had a good one too. I think Andy Reid's might be better than Belichick's was, but I know that it's really a high percentage of wins when you give Andy Reid that extra week. So those are kind of things that are. I think have to be in there when you're trying to figure out who's going to win this game. Of course, you got the quarterback for the Chiefs. He's been there. He's done that. He's one of the greats already. He's won it. Um, you got the younger quarterback hurt 
uh, of the Eagles. He hasn't been there. Will he handle the big moment? Will he handle the stage? Um, the you know the way Mahomes will. We don't know. We don't know till he's there. But I tell you this about the Philadelphia Eagles quarterback. Yeah, he's only in his second year. I think it's his second year. But he's been in big moments in college, Ken. You know, he he's he's played national title games in front of a yeah. hundred thousand, you know, people and millions of people on television. So I know it's not the Super Bowl, but it's not like this guy is going to have stage fright. Uh, is what I'm trying. Well, I mean, to say. the odds. The, I think the odds reflect that, right? The uh, Eagles yeah. are uh, minus one and a half points. Yes, yeah. life there minus one twenty five plus one hundred five on Kansas City. I'm going to give you my quick pick. With all that having said, it's hard. It's hard to bet against Andy Reid with the extra week and Mahomes and and Kelsey. Mahomes and Kelsey, unbelievable. And you got the two brothers playing against each other, first time in the history of Super Bowls. Kelsey brother, one from Philly, one playing, of course, Kansas City. Uh, the Kansas City tight end, Kelsey, he's probably, he, he's the best tight end in the game. I know that because my son tells me. And also, one of the greats of all time. So, that's a great combination. It's hard to beat that combination. At the end of the day, you figure I'm going to take Kansas City. You know what I do when, when you figure. So I might go the other way. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to say the Eagles, maybe it's their year. Just maybe, it, 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 maybe it's just their, it's the year of the Eagle. Maybe. Maybe. Teddy, the thought of those Eagle fans being the Super Bowl champs is a bit much for my stomach. Uh, I have I, some I, I have some friends from Philly who I love, but my God, as a whole, those are some rough fans, man. <laughs> I yeah. love when Dave Portnoy <laughs> Dave Portnoy's term, uh, not necessarily mine, it calls them the scumbags of Philly. Um I think <laughs> some of the fans there actually oh, embrace the moniker, tough. but uh <laughs> I yeah. hope you know what I'd like to see Philly win, like I said before, for our friends uh Frank uh, Conto and his son Sonny the heavyweight contender yeah, and my friend yeah. OT, the real, the rapper. But since you're taking Philly, I'm going to go with Kansas City. I think the experience gets them over, yeah, I think, for us yeah, here in Philly. I think Philly's the powerhouse. I think they're probably the better team. But and given Kansas the closest City's of the, the line, fighter. Kansas City's the fighter who's been battle-tested. You know yep. what I mean? He, 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 they've been battle tested. Philly's had a little bit of an easy sort of journey, you know, uh, to, a little easier, a lot easier actually. But um, hey, listen, they got the job done. They did what they had to do. So you could say it's because they were that good. But they haven't been really put through the trials the way Kansas City has. You know, they've been more like uh, one of these. Fighters, one of these promoters, fighters, you know, that are the house fighter uh, on one of these promotions, whether it's ESPN or whether it's PBC, whatever, that, you know, they're going to be taken care of uh, on their way to getting to that Super Bowl, you know, to getting to that title fight. They they get the benefit of being handed, uh, you know, pretty, uh, pretty easy opponents. But, hey, Philly... Philly beat who they had to beat. They're there. Uh, they're very confident. As you said, they're a one and a half point favorite for a reason. The guys that make those lines pretty good at doing that stuff. Uh, how, how do they figure the under over is going to be? Do they? Right, good uh, question for for the guys that uh, for our friends at my bookie. Please yeah. go to mybookie.ag only if you're going to bet on the game and don't bet money you can't afford to lose. Use your head. Um, use the promo code Atlas. They'll give you fifty percent credit on your first deposit. Let's see for over under Teddy. We got over fifty and a half. Uh, under over under at fifty and a half. E, uh, minus one ten either way. Over fifty and a half or under. What do you like? I'm going to go over. I mean, I, I know that... I, if I know, someone bets the under, I want to chop them in their throat. Who who roots for li little points? I want points. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the Super Bowl. You want... You know, it's the big stage. It's Broadway, right? It's, uh, yep. it's, it's, the, it's the big time. It's, it's, the, it's the big show. It's the big yep. show. You want points. You want points. I know defense wins titles and all that stuff, but you want entertainment. You want to see points. So I'm going to... I'm going to say... Uh, you know, both teams have enough explosive people on the offensive end uh, For sure. to get it done. Let's talk boxing now. 
the young prospect who I really like, Richard Torres Jr., the uh, heavyweight. Yeah, I know. That's, so, that's why I put him on the list because I know you'll – I mean, it's, it's barely worth mentioning one round. You know, they, they, fed, him, they fed him the raw beef again. But, but I know you like to talk about him. And look, he's a silver medalist. He's 6-0 and with six knockouts now. You know, um, what I like about him, he's got a little bit of a backstory, you know. I, um, they're, they're building up that story. I like it. There hasn't been somebody that you that you hear about that's as well read as he is, as far, far as you know, reading the the literary um, artists, uh, the literary uh, you know <clears throat> writers, uh, the people in the literary world, uh, the great authors. He he apparently he's he's a very intelligent guy, a guy that's. Uh, Loves to read, um, also loves music. Uh, I, I believe it's uh, more of the opera type, but you'll correct me in a minute. But whatever it is, I haven't really heard about a heavyweight or any fighter, really, for that matter, since the great, and I'm not comparing him because he's got a hell of a long way to go before Teddy Atlas will be mentioned and Richard Torres in the same breath as the great Gene Tunney other than right now but Gene Tunney you go back to the 20s uh the great the great Gene Tunney who was heavyweight champ beat Jack Dempsey in the long count beat him twice actually uh he was a guy that people the writers back then couldn't couldn't understand him they were like you read books like you read real books like not just books with a lot of pictures in them. You actually read books in camp? Yeah, that's what I do in camp. I read, you know, he, he would read all these top uh, writers, you know, and uh, I, whether it was, uh, I think he would read people like Socrates. He would read uh, whatever, some of the great novelists too. But people couldn't believe it. They were like heavyweight champ of the world that, you know, it was, it was thrown off the way that they looked at heavyweight champions, you know, like or any fighter for that well, matter, just because fighter. you're into into uh, yeah, uh, exactly. the sport of boxing but, doesn't but mean you're not point, a normal person. I, I always say, you want a champion, you better get a smart guy because That's yeah, right. he's got to be athletic, yeah, he's got to learn. I get it, he's got to be tough mentally, tougher than than most people will ever be or ever imagine they could be, but. You got to be smart. You got to outthink the guy. You got to outsmart. You got to figure this stuff out. You got to learn these things. It's not just about being strong. So anyway, I like the backstory that Torres is a well-read kid, um, that they were, like I said, I haven't heard anything like that uh, since Gene Tunney, uh, which is a hell of a long time ago, a um, hundred years ago. But what I like, look, he got rid of, you know, he, he did what you're supposed to do. When you're the promoter's fighter, you know, and you're being built up on TV and you're being fed T-bone steaks, right? Disguise yeah. his opponents, right? He ate them up. Um, but also being that he's a silver medalist from the Olympics, with all those amateur fights, he also did something he should do. You know, he showed some technique, a capacity to be, as I said, cerebral, and outsmart his outgunned opponent by stepping back and literally walking him, literally walking him in to the finishing punch of the night, the counter uppercut. I mean, he, you know, he... he Beautiful now listen, shot. Yeah, I mean, listen, again, he had the right opponent, I get it, but I like the way he did it. The point that I'm taking here is he did it, instead of just running the guy over like a Mack truck, you know, he he did it in a way that you would like to see a fighter that's going somewhere do it uh, by giving up ground and had his very cooperative opponent, you know, blindly follow him to slaughter like a calf walking into the slaughterhouse uh, with no idea that he wasn't coming out. But again, Torres is a uh, well-read, intelligent young man and... Uh, I connected with the history. I connected with Gene Tunney a little bit, bringing back that memory. Hopefully, he'll continue his winning. Win well, he will. I mean, let's face it. That's that's. We always like to be completely. Uh, hey, Teddy, he, uh, let's. Uh, uh, I no, no. I, I'm just saying we don't he, we don't go into the fantasy world over here. You know, <laughs> we we deal with the real world. Uh, he's going to be undefeated for the first what? 
year and a half, two years. That's another say the two fi- years. Another, fi- another five to ten fights. He's five yeah. and zero oh with five yeah. knockouts. So another, but I was going to say another two with years. The kid year Brian, now it's time j- just this couple steps. I will say, you know, they have done a good job in terms of finding guys that look good on paper because the combined uh, record of all his opponents so far is twenty eleven and one. I know that that doesn't necessarily say anything, but we've seen guys get in there. I mean, there was a guy on one of the cards the other night that was like three and 113. I mean, I'm not kidding. It was something outrageous that this guy was on a, even on a real card. Well, how but, about the guy? How about the guy? I know I'm jumping. I'm jumping leagues here. Uh, you know, as far as from the pros to 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 the to the crossover events now, uh, with the stuff that's going on. Obviously, with Jake Paul, who I give all the credit for in the world, he's not disrespecting the sport. I have to keep putting that qualifier out there. He's not disrespect. He's working. He's learning. He's uh, listen. You could say what you want. He's he's stealing money. I I look at it this way. He's earning money. Uh, he's doing it the American way. He found the niche. He found the way to make money. He worked to learn the game of boxing the best he could, and he's picking his opponent the best he could. But anyway, his next opponent, a boxer, because everybody been saying oh we don't want to see him with mma older mma fighters we want to see him with a box now he's fighting thomas fury tommy fury but tommy fury's the record of his he's eight no his eight combined opponents records ken i mean they make the guy that you just said with uh, they make the records of the ones you just said as though torres has like fought Jack Johnson, Jack Dempsey, Joe Lewis, um, Joe Frazier, Muhammad. I mean, they make it sound like <laughs> the combined records of the greatest in the annals of the sport compared uh, uh, to. Let me just Tommy, tell you quickly, Tommy, Tommy, Tommy Fury's opponents. Tommy Fury's opponents. You ready for this? Ten, yeah. w- ten wins, one hundred and two losses. That's no hard. wins. No, hold on. Listen to this one. No wins. 26 losses, two wins, 26 losses, no wins, 11 losses, no wins, nine losses. Then he fought a guy who was 2-0, and Jordan oh. Grant, and then he fought Anthony Taylor. He's The total opponents, his, to, his total wins for his opponents, I mean, okay, one guy won 10, but that guy also lost 102 fights. Like, if you show up 112 times, you're probably going to win 10 of they them got, just by getting in the, the ring. The total is somewhere around 20 and 176, something like that. There's not even 20, uh, yeah, there's 22, 24 wins and there's 200 losses. And I'm not kidding. And I think I think Jake Paul, I don't want to get too far down this because we'll do no, a full breakdown saying, now. But Jake Paul's going to destroy him. Comparatively, Jake Paul's gonna I kill like him. him. I think he's physically too strong for him. But listen, comparatively speaking, <laughs> wow. I mean, you know, but then again, you know, you could always get these crazy comparisons and teddy's around. only stopped four of those guys and he's fighting at freaking light heavyweight i mean at light so again, heavyweight now sh- now if you look at it that way which is not the right way but if you look at it that way you say oh taurus <laughs> Tor- <laughs> wow they're 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 they're, they're overmatching Torres. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but say, Torres is an know, Olympic silver medalist. He could beat half no, the friggin'. No. He could beat probably some guys in the top ten right now. I mean, after Obviously, you get through, I always the, say that, after you get but, through the first eight, six to eight. But guys, that's why like, you're not doing these guys a favor exactly. after the first couple because once you let them know the pros are no different than amateurs. It's a fight. You you've been you know. You've been baptized with the waters of the pros. Um, you, it's a mental thing. Okay, you're pro. Then l- let them fight guys that they'll learn something from. As we just said, guys like Tories, they've had 150, 200 amateur fights, whatever the heck he's had. But most of these guys that have gotten medals in the Olympics, you know, and they've been fighting the best fighters in the world, internationally, in the amateurs. Le- they're not going to learn nothing giving them these guys that they hit on the shoulder and they fall down and and they you know they look like they got to be caught it off you know on a stretcher i mean it's it's ridiculous let them fight guys i mean be responsible but let them fight something that they're gonna that they're gonna learn something that they're gonna develop with you know, and they're not going to start to get this entitled attitude that, oh, when I get in the ring, I'm, I'm supposed to have a guy that when I touch him, he falls down. No, no, that's not the real world, son. But anyway, I, I, um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? I um digress. I digress. I didn't want to. I didn't want to. I didn't want to regress or recess. <laughs> That's exactly right. No, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to. I was that. talking to someone the other day, and we were allowed. I was talking to my because, friend Ben because Anderson. like Tories, like Tories and Gene Tunney, my friend here, my partner here, is very well read. <laughs> I was talking to I was talking to my friend Ben Anderson, the war correspondent who used to be at Vice, and we were he would, he listens to every episode, and we were laughing when I said to him, I said to you one day, yeah, like the African strongman Robert Mugabe, thinking of the um, the dictator, and you were like, yeah, John Mugabe, he was really <laughs> tough, and I was like, that's Teddy, everything back to boxing, John yeah. John Mugabe, the, the beast. fighter, John yeah, the Beast Mugabe, that's right, <laughs> but then it was the, the great, dictator great, great, Robert great, Mugabe who was like yeah, a terrorist. Course. I fought um, the great uh, Marvin Hagler. Go ahead. Yep. All right. Before we get to the next one, I want to get to the uh, Barboza Pedraza fight. But before I do, Teddy, I want to thank our new spawn, our newest sponsor, Factor. Today's episode is brought to you by our newest sponsor, Factor. Factor gets you ready to eat healthy meals delivered straight to your door. The other day, I was telling Rob, "Hey, Rob, uh, I just got like twenty pre-made." awesome meals at my house i'm assuming they're from you or from our a new sponsor he's like yeah, yeah i got them too. They're tremendous tremendous yeah. easy to do good so taste good. good the right the right caloric uh intake if you will um the 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 right n- nutrients the uh it's healthy they're good uh they're fast uh and and they even sent the smoothies that i really really yep. enjoyed uh you know what i like the best i like the mango i know most people there's probably i don't know how many mango lovers out there there are i love but mangoes i i the mango was uh i got that from my background with the puerto rican all my puerto rican friends <laughs> and fighters you know that, Alfredo that, Benitez. That, yeah being around with them and uh always dealing with with those fighters and going to Puerto Rico in tournaments and stuff where I would take fighters in the amateurs, especially uh, mango, mango, really good. Uh, they, all their smoothies were good, but I really enjoyed the mango. I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yep. Oh, no problem. Factors, fresh, never frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. All you have to do is heat and enjoy, and I've been enjoying them. No matter your preference, Factor has you covered. They're delicious and have options like keto, calorie smart, vegan, and veggie, protein plus, and more. Simply go to factormeals.com slash atlas50 and use the code atlas50, A-T-L-A-S-5-0, and get 50% off your first box. The code ATLAS50 at factormeals.com slash ATLAS50. Get you 50% off your first box. The only part I'll disagree with you, Teddy, is you said they're just the right caloric intake. That is right. If you're not doing much that day and you just need three meals, they got you covered. But (laughs) when I'm done running, I need two of them. And my wife said, my wife goes, I think the point there is that they're the perfect balanced meal. I said, yes. Yeah, for a unless, normal person, but yeah. I'm not normal. You're burning up. You're burning up so much. But you know, the great thing about them is it's kind of like having your own tailor. You know, when when you go to a tailor and you say, "I want it made this way. I want a suit yeah. that's specially made to fit me this way. Look this," uh, they they make you they make them where they're tailor made, where you can pick exactly what you need. Exactly, like That's you right. said, if you have to, you double up. <laughs> well, speaking of, speaking of tailors, you remember my friend Frank Shattuck, who was a boxer from the New York Athletic Club, who made me that awesome newsboy cap that I wore one day. Yeah. He's a huge fan of the show. Shout out to Frank Shattuck, custom tailor in upstate New York. He's never made anything for me other than the cap. I'm just telling you, he's oh, a you good man. Oh, you got stuff coming now. After this, after this wish, shout out, you, you have his, some suits His coming. suits are expensive, Teddy. He's dressing guys like Fred Astaire back in the day. Um, but hey, you mentioned the mangoes in the puerto ricans one what a dad to fred astaire was wow yeah but 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 see right away you talk about me you joke about me boxing what do i think right away ali fraser you have to have a dance partner so <laughs> fred, fred astaire was great but without ginger rogers wouldn't have been as great you know what don't i mean you wish, had, don't you had wish to have you a dance, dance partner like had to have a you know gene kelly you know ginger rogers <laughs> fred astaire you have to have a partner to dance muhammad yeah. ali joe frazier what would ali be without frazier you know uh toro Gotti, mickey ward oh yeah yeah um you know what when i see dancers like that don't you wish you could just dance really well that it just came naturally yeah, to I do. you or you, or I you could sing do. it's funny you I, said I, that I, 
If I could I dance every true. time they played music at a fight or a ball game, I'd be in the aisles going, look at all these moves I got. Because when I see my someone problem who can really is dance, I think, I'm like, I Whoa. used to think I had rhythm until I got married. And my wife said, you have, <laughs> you have absolutely no rhythm. And I hey. remember one time we were at, a, <laughs> we were at an engagement with uh, with. Michael Morrow was there with us. You know, he was like, he became like family. He won, obviously, won the heavyweight title, and I trained him. Um, and so we were at some, I forget what it was, but we're out there dancing. And, um, and he's, he's looking at me, and he's, and, and he sees, <laughs> he sees me, you know, like my wife said, I don't have, I don't know, rhythm. And he looks at me, he goes, Teddy, Teddy, you, you, you're not supposed to, make the music you're not supposed to dance to the words you're supposed to <laughs> dance to the music like now you know i said hey you know you want me to do the alley shuffle maybe i could do that maybe i could do a version of that but i yeah. guess i'm not a dancer but and then he's out there and he's moving you know he's moving he's saying this is the way you move this is the way. <laughs> i say all right just listen just make sure you throw enough punches while you're moving your <laughs> And never throw one when you can throw two. Hey, you, you mentioned the mangoes in Puerto Rico. I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to our friend, the great Rosie Perez. She's on the show on um, Showtime called Your Honor with Brian Cranston, who was the star of Breaking Bad. Oh, my God. Rosie is so good in this show. If you've never seen this show, this uh, this is not a plug. This is just sincerity. My wife is so watching it. I know she loves it. It's Oh my God, Rosie is so good. I love Rosie Perez. And for those, for people who are looking for a t-shirt, we have this t-shirt and we have another version in the um, at teddyatlas.com. Uh, Rosie's husband, Eric, Perez, uh, Eric Hayes, one of the best artists in the world, he designed that logo for us. So like that has a lot of incredible value just in the logo uh, design itself. So go to teddyatlas.com, grab our t-shirt. Rosie's been on ESPN with me years ago. She came on for something and she's come to she's my been, foundation. She's been on our show here. Yeah, she came on our show, of course, years ago when we first were starting, a few couple years ago, whatever. And um, she was on, it was great. And she comes to my foundation dinner charity dinner to help us raise money to help people that need help so i appreciate her very much i um i don't know if i gave her the the, the title of queen of uh queen of new york or queen of boxing the 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 queen of boxing i don't know i i know i mentioned it on espn a couple of times maybe somebody else actually gave i would hate to be stealing somebody else's thunder the way people steal mine <laughs> um, uh, uh, in, in the com especially in the boxing business, in the hey, speaking business. of, I heard some. I heard your uh, words on ESPN this weekend. Someone was talking about running red lights without getting oh, caught. I thought God. maybe, I thought maybe they played your voice. You, you with know your how words. to stir it up. You know how to stir it up. And <laughs> get my blood pressure going, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> thanks, pal. I just wanted to recognize your quote. I've never heard that from anyone except you. It yeah, must have thanks. been someone that's been around you a lot in the past. That's. I uh, see. That's when I turn the volume off. I got to be honest. Call me, <laughs> call me trivial. Call me thin skinned. I don't care. Whatever you want to, it's okay. But I got to put the volume off when I hear uh, certain commentators literally using my words, my Teddy, phrases. you know what the crazy thing is about that? I, I recently gave a speech to some high school kids just about I know, the dangers I know of it, drugs. It's supposed to be, I know it's supposed to be the greatest form of flattery and all that, but it doesn't feel good. We're human. We're human. I know. I, I'm going to tell you a way that when you can somebody's do that. Stealing or grabbing your stuff i, don't I know. think you can do that and look like a good friend and a teammate at the same time so when i was giving this speech oh, well, to some kids true. in that's rochester true. i said hey listen everyone is is has experiences fear my friend teddy alice would describe the time going to the waiting to go into the ring as the hardest part of a fight not the actual fight because your imagination can create all these things and i said this guy's like a, a psychological guru he's taught me all this but to now i've got the point across i've used your material i've credited you i look like an even better team player and everybody wins and no one's offended and it's like hey yeah i i, I no one there's very it, the i just wouldn't going feel on for right. a long see, time it's hard to have all your own original material I, just I credit just, where credit's due see i just wouldn't feel right grabbing somebody else's thoughts and using them constantly if if I wasn't at least giving them some 
a little That's it. credit. It's so I, easy to do. I just wouldn't do. feel right. I just, yeah. like, you know, like when I talk about the old time sayings, like the fighters, this guy, I think they're great sayings. They're great. I used them on ESPN for years. For the 26 years I was calling the fights there. Uh, I would I would say, oh, this guy's harder to... This guy's harder to miss than he is to hit. That's a great saying. He's, it's harder to miss this guy than it is to hit. Like the great Mickey Duff would say. You know. Yeah. But anyway. Um. <laughs> I'm with you. All right. Let's, let, let's get <laughs> on to the next dokey. one so your blood Okey pressure dokey. doesn't get too high. All right. Um, Junior, Wel Junior welterweight contender Arnold Barboza remains unbeaten. Ten-round unanimous decision over former two-division title holder Jose Petraza on Saturday. Uh, he won on the scorecards by 97-93 and 96-94 twice. Uh, relatively close on the scorecards, but I thought um, Barboza looked really good in this one. I had him win it pretty, pretty handedly. What would you think? Good fight. Uh, he... He kind of followed the same blueprint as Torres did in the prelim fight where, big difference, of course, Barbosa had a real opponent in front of him, former world champion, two-division champion in Pedraza. Um, of course, Torres didn't. But he used the same blueprint, controlling the outside, giving up ground, you know, to set up counter punches throughout the night. That's what Barbosa's blueprint was, and he stuck to it. He... Um, he was, he was catching Pedraza as he came in. Um, Barbosa, he he really he played the role of the spider for the first eight rounds, inviting Pedraza into his parlor or his web and looking to eat, you know, looking to eat him up a little bit or at least pick away uh, pieces of him, you know, bites here and there, um, which is what he was doing. And to Barbosa's credit. He stuck to his plan, giving ground and countering before Pedraza could fully close in. He just stayed far enough ahead of Pedraza where he always had the edge, where he could catch Pedraza with some combinations or at least deter him with combinations before Pedraza could make up the ground. Kind of like I've said this before, Ken, like if you're, if you're on top of a hill, and you got kids coming after you, but you're on top of the hill and you're throwing stuff at them. You got the big edge. You're going to hit them before they can get up that hill. They might still get up the hill, depending on what you're hitting them with. But <clears throat> if you're hitting them hard enough with certain things, they might never get up that hill. That's kind of what Barbosa did. And that's what fighters do when they use, when they use the real where they know how to use distance and range, where you control range, where you separate yourself enough, where the other guy has to come to you, he's got to get up that hill, you have an edge. And the edge doesn't last long, just lasts for two or three punches, maybe one second, where you get those punches off before you close the gap. Then it's up to you to get up that hill again, to stay up there and keep that edge so he never fully gets up the hill. I think that's a great analogy. That's what Barbosa did for eight rounds, seven rounds, seven full rounds he did. But then finally, I gave credit to Barbosa for following his game plan. I got to give credit to my man Pedraza for following his because his, it didn't look like it at the beginning because he was losing those rounds, but his was to keep pressure, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up until it finally what do I say all the time? Pressure breaks pipes. Pressure breaks people. Pressure's like on a July day. I wonder if you used that the other night. Uh, on a July day where, <laughs> you, where you got a little puddle out there, Ken, right? Laying out there on the asphalt. You got a little water out there, and it's hot. And all of a sudden, the puddle starts to evaporate right in front of your eyes. And then you come back 30 minutes later, there's no puddle. That's what pressure in a fight does. And that's what Pedraza was hoping would happen. And he stuck to it. The son of a gun, he's a real pro. He stuck to his plan. He kept the pressure on for seven rounds, eight rounds. And in the eighth round, the puddle started to evaporate. Yep, Barbosa started to crackle. He started to crack a little bit, and he started to get to him, and it became really, really interesting. Pedraza, 
started to have his way a little bit. But what really made it a really interesting, terrific fight was you got to peak. As I often say, you, you know, you want the, you look at the car, it's a race car, it's great. You know, you look at Barbosa like a car, the, the tires, everything looks great. You know, it's running good, you know, but you want to pick up the hood and you want to make sure that the carburetor and everything is there for the long haul. You want to make sure it's got the goods under the hood. Guess what? The hood got lifted in the eighth round and Barbosa showed that he's got the goods. He he did what I often talk about again. Not just showed you he knew how to fight like a champion. He knew how to behave like a champion. Even more important, he knew how to behave like a champion. And he did. He, he behaved like a champion. And what did he do? He lost that round there. You know, he started having trouble. But he made a decision. Very smart. Where and the commentators didn't really touch on this, but he made a decision, and they're 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 good. I'm just saying that from my viewpoint, I can only see it from my viewpoint. What I, the comments that I would make, is that he'd been boxing all night long, being on top of the hill, controlling range, catching Pedraza before he could get close to him. Now he realized. It was kind of like those old Western movies when the Indians are starting to come to the fort and you got to hold the fort and they're starting to come over the wall. You got to man the wall. You got to man the wall and you got to have people on that wall. That's kind of what Bosa did. He said, they're coming to take the fort. Petras is looking to really overrun this fort. I got to put men on the wall. And instead of continuing to move backwards and retreat and give up ground, he would have got run over. He would have gotten run over. But instead, he manned the fort. He stood with him. He stood with him. A lot of people would have said, oh, I'm not so sure about that. He was sure about it. He behaved like a champion. Ken, he knew that he had to make a stand. If he kept moving the way he did for the first seven rounds, he would have gotten caught. Because as he was going backwards, Pedraza was coming with great confidence now, great speed now, and and he, he, he would have caught him. He would have caught him going backwards, and the spiral would have continued. The, 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 the momentum would have continued in Pedraza's way, and Pedraza would have started to dominate the fight. That's what would have happened. But he stood. He locked in, he grabbed the floor, and he stood there, and he, and he fought him off. And that is what won the fight for him. Then later on, he was able to go back in spots to a little bit of, you know, being on top of the hill, separating himself, getting a little bit of distance, and looking to count. But he had to make enough of a stand, hold the fort long enough for the troops to get there. For the cavalry to arrive, for you know, for for him to be able to slow up the onslaught of Pedraza, it was brilliant. I, it went. It wasn't talked about, but it was instinctive. It was his innate intelligence to understand what he had to do. It just what at that moment, when when he was faced with survival, with winning or losing, what he needed to do how he needed to behave and react and he did and he held him off enough where for the rest of he lost some of those late rounds that's what made it close but he was able to also hold enough ground in those late rounds with the lead that he built for the first seven rounds to win the fight by two three points and keep his title um that's what i saw that's what I appreciated. That's what I wanted the fans to make sure that they 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 could see it and appreciate it and see understand all the dimensions that go into this great sport. You know, mentally, emotionally, you know, technically, physically, everything. So that that was a terrific fight, really. I, I applaud both guys. They both behaved like champions. Pedraza behaved like a former champion and Barbosa 
behave like a champion who's just not ready to be a former champion. He's just not ready to be a former one. Not yet. Not yet. I love that. Yeah. I love that that part from the movie Gladiator, where where they got the they got the um, guys that are the gladiators, right? And yeah. and uh, and um, Russell Crowe, you know, who's the great general. What's his name? General um, uh, that you know remember. that. Became a slave. I know you're you talking know. about uh, Maximus uh, Aurelius. Maximus, or yeah, uh, Maximus, Maximus. How can I forget Maximus? The great Maximus. <laughs> and so Maximus, and he's with these, he's with all these uh, other slaves now, uh, gladiators, and one of them is having a conversation before they go into another one of these death matches, basically. And the guy says, "Do you believe in the afterlife?" And he's and Maximus, the great Maximus, says, "Yes, I do. Do you believe you'll be with your family in the afterlife?" He goes, "Yes, I do, but not yet." <laughs> I love that. He goes, "But not yet, not yet. And we ain't dying yeah. today. We ain't dying today." I love it, and and that's that's kind of what it was with Barbosa that you know. Someday he w- will have to probably have his title taken away from him. Somebody will take it away from him, but not yet. Yep. He not yet. Yep. Well, in the uh, in the main event, Emmanuel Navarrete, Lamb, uh, Lamb Smith, Lamb Wilson. What an incredible fight this was! Back and forth, back and forth. Both guys were awesome, but you know who wasn't awesome was referee Chris Flores. I think for me, the biggest yeah. takeaway—the only thing I in couldn't the fourth get past round, in this, that fourth round, I know. I mean, Teddy knocks him down. That fourth and, round, and, that fourth and, round, that was rough. I know. Navarrete's on clear he gave, street. He he's, 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 he's legless. I mean, he was he was out. He got caught a good shot. I think it hit him like a he behind the ear time. on the temple. Way too much. I think they added up. It was like 27 and, seconds. And they didn't even talk about it, which is even worse. It was crazy. It's like watching a, a crime. Big... It's like watching a bank get robbed. And, and you know, you're just watching a bank get robbed. And you're, you're watching a, or you're watching something, you know, somebody get robbed down the street. And you're just standing there saying, hey, um, you know, wh- what are you getting for lunch? You, uh, you, are you getting tuna again today? Or are you going to switch over to chicken salad? Hey, you, there's a... There's something going on over here. There's a robbery going on here. It's very easy for us to watch. It's I very mean, easy for us to watch and kind of dismiss as business as usual. But just think for a second. Really think about this. If that's your son, brother, best friend, how pissed off are you sitting there watching? Ref, what are you doing? Let's go. Get back at it. And like, it happens too often. Game too, it often. too often. I mean... That was his chance, man. This kid was an eighteen to one underdog. I had no dog in this fight. I don't care who wins. My kids hey, I will like, say Dad, this. Who do you I like? Will... I'm like, uh, I just listen, like to watch. I just want competitive fights. The kid had a chance to do something special, and the ref did everything he could to and make they never sure had that, that it chance didn't again. Like that. Probably nope. never have it again. No, nope. probably never have it again. It's like seeing Haley's comet. You you miss it. You miss it. Seeing the yep. eclipse of the moon, the total <laughs> eclipse of the moon. No, seriously. I if, know. If you're it's, not it's there a, at ten o'clock on Monday. Monday night on on December eighth. If you're not out there on that date that they tell you that it's happening, you ain't seen it again. It's gone. Yep. It's done. Well, a lot of times that's what this is. You're right. This is their one shot. Everything lined up perfect for them, and they're in there for the title. If they don't, if they don't get it done that day, they ain't getting it done ever again. Eighteen to one underdog. He had the kid hurt very badly with time to finish him. Who knows? Maybe he doesn't. You know, just. But I mean, can you please be fair? Can you please just count? Because if the roles were reversed, they would have been like, that ref would have given him the friggin' as soon as he hit eight, he'd be like, go ahead. As soon as he realized the guy could still stand up. But nope, not this time. They made sure that he was perfectly fine. They did what they could to make sure he was recovered. But man, you have to feel for Lamb Smith. And like I said, I had no dog in the fight. I don't care either way. I, I, I didn't care who won. But I love a competitive fight. And you just hate to see someone get cheated. That's just blatant cheating on, on behalf of the ref. I don't care. You can sugarcoat it however you want. You have one job, dude. You're the ref. Give the guy an eight count. Make sure he's okay to continue and let's go. Not 27 seconds while you're messing around with mold pieces and everything. Man, it's just a heartbreaking for the kid, Lamb Smith. I hate to see it. Navarrete ends up stopping him, I think, in the um, 
was it the ninth? I'm sorry, I should know this, but he stopped him later yeah, in the ninth. fight. He knocked him yeah, down a couple times. Tonight. He had him hurt bad. It was a good stoppage. He was out. It was over. Yeah, he took over the seventh, eighth, and ninth. The ninth, yeah. I think he stopped. Um, yeah. Listen, welcome to my world, friend. All right, buddy? Jeez, welcome to my world. You know, almost 30 years of watching this stuff, calling the fights on ESPN, seeing it over and over and over and over and over again. I mean, really, it does something to you after a while. It's like... Hundred I mean, percent. Really, uh, you know, to the point where I was trying to put together a national commission to stop this stuff. You know, with with uh, the late Senator John McCain, the late great Senator McCain, who was a hero of this country. You know, in the war, and um, he was a POW, matter of fact. And it's interesting that that didn't get passed. Boxing. I wonder what the I wonder what powers uh, were working against it. Uh, well. <laughs> But believe me, there were powers working against it, and some of those powers were given money uh, that it was public domain. We were able to look it up as we were going down the road with this. They were given a uh, campaign. Uh, they were getting, put it this way, those powers that stopped it from happening, you know, in the government that we needed not to stop it from happening, uh, you know, to do what McCain wanted to do, which was to get this National Commission, which I wanted, which other people with me wanted. Um, there were powers in the government that um, they were getting campaign contributions from certain promoters that you might recognize their names, okay? <laughs> uh, and, and, like Vince you know, McMahon would say, if you can't control the outcome, it's hard to promote a like really uh, profitable business. Yeah. And you can control 90% certainty the the outcomes. It's easy to like keep the gravy train rolling. Yeah, so that, that got in the way, unfortunately, that some of these uh, politicians that did not feel the way we felt that they wanted a more honest sport in boxing, uh, <laughs> you know. So we never quite got to the finish line with that, unfortunately. Um, but we, we were given it, not that it helps anyone, we were given it the old college try. But to break down this fight, another terrific fight, um, and early on, I could just, nobody was talking about this because they were talking about the champion Navarrete and his power and all that stuff and not giving Wilson much of a chance coming all the way from Australia, eight to 18 to one underdog, as you said, Ken. I, for my position, for my view, I'm watching it and I could just see that Navarrete, the champion, and obviously the huge favorite, I could just see that he might get caught with a counter because he was throwing a lot of looping shots and loading up and falling in. And and I'm watching it, and I know that the, you know it's all about Navarrete because, like I said, he's a punch, he's a champion. But I'm saying, wait a minute. This guy Wilson is going to catch him something here because he's throwing more together punches um, the tighter punches, the crisper punches. He was ma maintaining better position and controlling his range really well. And, you know, he was staying balanced better. Um, and sure enough, in the fourth round, Everett, he leads. He does a big technical no-no. You, you hear me talk about it when I call the fights all the time. Uh, and I would never let a fighter do this in the gym. But it has to be corrected in the gym. Otherwise, they're going to do it in the ring. And Navarrete, sure enough, he leads with a right uppercut from too far away. And Wilson counters him with a beautiful left hook. And that's when it brought on your Ajita, you know, um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, your, your stomach aches and... and uh, your version of high blood pressure where you got upset. And I got upset too where the referee gave him so much time. But he got caught. Wilson caught him a beautiful left hook. The gap was there. The hole was there. You know, Navarrete left that big hole with that lead right uppercut. And he survived the round with a, you know, like that song goes with a little help from my friends. Um, that, that, was that his entry song? That should be his entry song, maybe, <laughs> the next time coming into the ring. With a little help from my friends. Um, or, or, Teddy, you could also have the song that says, you know, you can't always get what you want, but if you try hard enough, you'll get what you need. 
Yeah, that's a <laughs> good one case, too. The Rolling you'll Stones. Get, you needed a little extra time to recover. I say this one quick thing, Teddy, about this is if you're on Navarrete's team and you're listening to to me and to and to Teddy and you're saying, I give oh, all the credit in jerk. the world. No, no, you're an idiot if you think that because the people think that they're idiots because I thought Navarrete, Navarrete, um. Did what I the greatest accolades I always give fighters when I give it to him that he behaved like a champion. He found a way to survive. He he has no control over what the ref does. He he behaved like a champion and he came back. To the people who are who are supporters of Navarrete, I get it. And you're like, oh bullshit, he didn't do this, he didn't do that. I say, okay, if guess what, if they did it to the other kid today, you might be on the wrong end of this tomorrow. You should, sure. everyone should just want fairness down the middle. 100%. It's the same thing in politics. When a Republican's in, in office, the Democrats thing in, do what they want. They, well, when the other guy gets in office, they're going to do the same shit. Ken. At some point, someone's going to say, we need to just do what's right half the time. How about just half the time? We'll just start small steps, baby Wouldn't you like that steps. in society right now? Seriously. Exactly. Wouldn't, it's crazy. Wouldn't that, be a pretty, wouldn't that be a pretty damn good idea in society right now if everyone just got treated properly and a, and the same and and by merit not by anything else i mean that that might not be a bad idea we're at the height teddy we're at the height of gaslighting if you disagree with me i'll make it sound like you're so crazy even if you're right and i'm dead wrong i'll just continue to lie and it, we're seeing it all over the place with like all the different issues that are going on from the spy balloon to the vaccines. If you don't agree with the party line or whoever controls the mainstream media, you are a complete idiot and a conspiracy theorist. No, words, you're not words, free to yeah, think. Words, you're an enemy. You're like an enemy exactly. of the state or Just, whatever. I'd say to my wife on a regular basis, we can agree to disagree on this. I don't want to like get upset, but I don't agree with you. You don't agree with me. Let's just move on. Let's just talk about something else. And that's how 90% of these topics are. It's okay to disagree. But but we're in this state of affairs where if you disagree with anything that the mainstream or any f group says, like you're, you're, you're an idiot, a moron, and an enemy to the people that agree with whatever the topic du jour is. It's just crazy. You're not allowed to question anything. You just have to go along like sheep anyway i digress as we say um that was an awesome fight though a lot no. of action in that fight save for the ref that was entertaining well and, from uh, the from the fourth round he he survives okay right and then what happens he comes out he gets his cobwebs he's dealing with the cobwebs in the fifth round you know he's um he being navarette the, the champion you know he's He's getting rid of the cobwebs. He's behaving like a champion. And then the kind of like, if you ever watch those nature channels, which I love to watch with my grandson and, and with both my grand, all my grandkids when they're all together. But I know Joseph loves to watch them where you're watching nature, you're watching the animals out in nature. But in this case, where you see a, a tidal wave starts in the middle of the ocean. It starts to build up. It starts to build up. It gets bigger, bigger. And by the time it gets to shore, it's a tidal wave. But it's gradually picking up speed, momentum, right? All of that. And that's what I was watching. I was watching. He got rid of the cobwebs, never read in the fifth round, Ken. And then he was like that out in the ocean, building that wave. He started to build that wave more and more, the rhythm, if you will. He got a rhythm going of his flow. The, a wave is a good analogy because in boxing, you got to have a flow of your offense. You got to have a flow, a rhythm. And he started to get that flow of punches. And it started around the fifth round, just like the wave starts in the ocean, in the middle of the ocean, and then in sixth round, and then the seventh, it built big. And the eighth, it built even bigger. And then it finally crashed to shore, and it put Wilson on the rocks in the ninth round. And that that's what the fight was. And I, I give him credit for getting himself together. Um, and once he got his rhythm going, boy, oh boy, he just kept it going. The most damaging punch was the one, I guess it was the ninth round, was the right hand landed by Navarrete. And again, 
never had got caught the left hook in the fourth round because of a technical flaw. It's usually a technical flaw that gets these guys hurt. It usually is. And same thing here. It was a technical flaw by Wilson. He threw a jab, and he stayed stationary. In the gym, you've been in the gym with me in training camp, Ken. What do I say after a guy throws a punch? Don't wait for the receipt. Don't take a picture. <laughs> Don't take a picture. And he took a picture, and the flashbulbs went off. Unfortunately, they went off in his head because he got hit with that freaking right hand from Navarrete, where Wilson threw the jab, but again, a flaw. A flaw in his technique, in his habits. And you, you develop good habits, they will, they will save you. You develop ha bad habits, they will come back to haunt you. You know, it, it's the same way in life. It's the same way in life. And it, you pick up bad habits, like, you know, like Ken was talking about giving lessons to his kids. You know, you, you might not like to hear it, but you learn, you listen, you develop the good. Later on in life, you'll be, you'll be saved. You'll be saved by them. You pick up bad habits, you'll be destroyed later on in life by them. Well, that's kind of what happened with Wilson. In the ninth round, I know the wave was already crashing into him, but he throws a jab, he stands there, the right hand comes right over, crashes, does the big damage, uh, you know, and really ends the night for Wilson. Um, the referee, I have to say, we we destroyed him in the fourth round. I'll give him credit in the last round. He did he did give Wilson every look before he stopped it. I will say that. I mean, it was... I agree. Uh, I, you would, could, I agree with you. Ken, you could also say it didn't matter at that point. You know, it was easy that's to That's exactly that. what I was going to yeah, say. Yeah, and you'd be right. You'd be right because at that point, it was uh, the, the, the horse was out of the barn. You know what I mean? It, it didn't matter. At the same time, I will point it out because we, we like to be fair here. Nobody could say we don't look at all sides because we really do. And the referee took a look, took a look, took a look. He could have probably stopped it a little tiny bit earlier, kept looking, w wanted to make sure that he didn't stop it too early. And then finally, he stopped it uh, when it needed to be stopped. Because Wilson, you know, Wilson was just going to take even more damage. Um, I, I want to, I have to mention this. First of all, all my applause to both fighters. It was, it was a good fight. And Wilson came over from Australia and he fought his heart out. And Navarrete, as I always, as I always say, um, behaved like a champion. He, he didn't just fight like he behaved like one when he had to. Um, so they both get my accolades. But I have to mention this because, again, I think the fans expect we cover, we try to cover everything, everything that we need, that we feel needs to be covered. And I would be wrong if I didn't mention that something that bothered me was having... Wilson's two little children there at ringside. Now listen, God bless them. I think it's the greatest thing in the world you have family and you have kids and you flew them in from Australia. Greatest thing in the world. It's a family thing. You're going to celebrate winning the title. You think you're going to win the title. You're going to celebrate it as a family. Yes, yes, yes. Let them be in the room. They're little kids. Let them be in the room. And then when daddy comes comes in, when they wake up the next day, they can see da daddy with the world title. Or if he don't have the world title, they can say daddy fought a great fight. He'll win the world title next time. Oh, we love you, daddy. We're proud of you, daddy. But to have two kids that young at ringside, I'm just not an advocate of it. Because I know how brutal this sport is. I know how unforgiving this sport is. I just don't think that kids that young, that young, can can properly understand what's going on when their father's getting hit. Can can properly, you know, deal with that at that age and see their father because you're gonna get hit. You're gonna get hit. And then of course he got hit. And he got hit. And he got hit. I just it bothered me where 
I I got I'm blessed. You're blessed. The ones uh, audience, so many of you are blessed to have children, and even blessed afterwards to have grandchildren, like I am. I I would not want my kids at that age. Not at that age. A little older, yeah, okay, but at that very young age, to be at ringside to see their daddy getting hit by another man, to the point that you know. He's got to be protected by the referee where they, again, they can't properly understand it. They, they just don't have the capacity yet to understand why is this man hurting my father? Yeah, that's I, a good I, point. And, and really, I'm telling you, I, it bothered me. But anyway, I give all the credit in the world, uh, as I said, to both fighters, um, I understand that it's the decision made by Wilson and his wife. It's their under, it's their dis- I understand it. I get it. I just, for me, I, I, I just, like I said, I, I just wouldn't be an advocate for that. Um, anyway, uh, all, all, nothing but, nothing but great respect. Uh, for the effort that Wilson gave and for, of course, the effort that Navarrete gave uh, to keep his title. Yeah, awesome fight. All right, let's jump over to the um, theater at Madison Square Garden and uh, more or less all-female event. Uh, the great Amanda Serrano, Puerto Rico's own in action against Erica Cruz from Mexico. Um, when I was watching this fight, I sent you and Rob a text. I said, the, the defense is masterful in here. It reminded me of like a Pernell Whitaker just slipping and bobbing. Of course, I was being sarcastic. I love some Man- Amanda Serrano. I did an interview with her once in... Um, um, in New York, so I'm a huge fan, but there was not a lot of defense on display here. Um, to use a quote from you, they would have been offended if you missed them. Um, they hit Mickey, each other. For, with I will bombs. put forward the quote from the great Mickey Duff. You know, <laughs> yeah. harder to miss than to hit. And there then I'll throw no in another one. I'll throw on another here. one because I know that you love them, Ken. I'll throw <laughs> another one. This you know, where they would say, you know, if it was. I'm, I'm going to say it as though it was men fighting. This fella gets insulted if you miss him, Teddy. So, <laughs> you know, but... um, They, go, they were bombing away. Accidental headbutt early on, split Erica. They know how to behave uh, like Erica fighters. Cru- they know head. how to behave like fighters. She was bleeding profusely, and yeah. she just kept going... She didn't just just didn't seem she wasn't on the level with Serrano in terms of of um, technique. She had her head down a lot, winging punches. But my God, toughness in spades she had as much toughness as anyone that's ever been in a ring i mean she took a pummeling all night and uh amanda serrano just also can take a shot but she just walked through everything and just kept throwing they threw so many punches i was like my god there's nothing going on here except constant punching so um interesting and um yeah, I love I love Amanda Serrano. Happy for her. Happy for the uh, people in uh, the Brooklyn Puerto Ricans. They were out in force. How'd you like that one? Uh, it was a great fight. It was, um, and I want to. First of all, some of these women. Oh my goodness, are they so tough? Oh, <laughs> wow, scary. I mean, tough. really, it's and and I want to just real quickly give credit to the cold feature because the women there and that woman, the one that lost, Mechaled, um, who lost to the champion. Um, Bomb Gardner, wow! It was Mechaled. Uh, Mechaled, oh, was she tough? Oh, was she tough? Uh, again, some of these women are so tough. But getting to the the fight at hand, Serrano Cruz, um, I, 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 we take our hats off, you know. As and I take my hat off if I was wearing one, as a gentleman should to a to a lady, but in this case, just to salute and recognize a champion's be- behavior. I mean, she truly, truly behaved. Um, I'm talking about Cruz right now. Both of them, both of them were great, but Serrano will get her credit, and she got it already. She won the fight. But yeah, I can't give enough. I, I would feel guilty. If I didn't spend a couple minutes really giving the credit that I'm giving right now to Cruz 
as I said, for to recognize the champion's behavior, as I always talk about, she behaved like a champion, um, as did Serrano, as to so many of these women fighters, as did Katie Taylor several months back in the in the summer when she beat Serrano in the big garden. They fought, I think it was in the small of, um, in a hula theater, I believe is where the fight was, right? But the That's bigger right. the bigger garden during the summer was Serrano and, and Katie Taylor, and my goodness, both of them. But what hard Taylor showed, and of course Serrano too. They showed that just the great, really pride and toughness that is so connected with, in particular with Cruz, that's so connected to Mexican fighters, you know, where that that's passed down, you know, that 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 tradition of fighting, the tradition of toughness. I mean, Cruz really personified that. Um, and usually you you'd think Teddy'd be talking about this with a you know with a man fighter, but no. I'm just talking about that's where it doesn't separate man or woman. It, it, it's just a fighter. It's just about, it's kind of like what you were talking about earlier, like about race. When people make everything in society now about race, race, race. I don't, uh, uh, stop it. It's about people. It's about humanity. It's about human beings. That's what it's about. The human race, one race. And that's what I'm talking about here. That, it was she personified what a what a fighter is, whether it's a woman, a man, whatever. Just what a fighter is and how a fighter behaves, what a fighter looks like. It it looks like that a person that's that proud, that tough, that un ungiving, unwilling. To give, to submit. Uh, uh, you know, I had once said something to the writer, Ron Borch, who's one of the top writers in boxing, um, one of the top writers in football and sports. He wrote for the he wrote for the um, Boston up in your part of town where you come from, the Boston Globe for the Herald. He wrote for them. He was their top writer for years. One time he came to a Mickey Ward fight that was in New England somewhere on ESPN. And... It wasn't, you know, publicized as a huge fight, Ken. It was a fight on the way up. Without fights like this, Mickey Ward doesn't get to that huge fight with, with Arturo Gatti for a million dollars. You know, so they were all important, even though you don't know it at the time. So Mickey Ward's fighting a fighter named Green. And Mickey Ward is getting, he's getting, oh, he's getting clobbered. He's getting, he is getting driven from ring post to ring post with punches. And and it's oh, and you know the referee's looking. Uh, I mean, he's just taking punishment. And then during the course of the fight, I actually said, "This fight ain't over. Mickey's got a chance to land his his patented punch." You know, uh, he's not the only one who had it, but I called it his patented punch: the left hook to the liver. You know, his Sunday punch, his his his, the, his magical punch, where he he. He taps you up top, creates your elbow up a little, and then he gets you with the liver punch, the left hook. But he was just missing it. Just missing it. Just missing it. Just missing it. Round after round after round. So finally I said, if he would just change the angle, and instead of throwing like a traditional hook, throw it like an uppercut to the body, it would get in there past the elbow instead of being blocked. And he must have hurt me. And he must have hurt me. I'm kidding, of course. But... All of a sudden, he does. His instinct under pressure, you know, what allowed him to get to through the fight was that part, the mental part. You wouldn't think that because it was all about toughness. But he's, he, he makes that little adjustment and he throws the left hook slightly inside the elbow instead of outside. And sure enough, it lands and he hurts screen and he jumps all over him. Oh my goodness, he jumps all over him. And he goes, chases him down, and he gets he gets rid of him. It was just sensational. And after the fight, Ron Borges, my friend, the writer, he says, Teddy, 
I, I need a I need a quote for the for my story. I'm doing a story. I said, You want a quote? He goes, Yeah, what did you see tonight? I said, You know what I saw tonight? I saw what a kid sees the first time they go to the zoo. He goes, The zoo. I said, Yeah. The first time they go to the zoo. They go to the zoo. What does every kid going to the zoo for the first time want to see? They want to see the lion. They want to see the lion. And they get there, they take the parent takes them, okay, you're gonna I'm gonna see the lion. They're all excited. I'm gonna see the lion with the lion. And now they get a little closer, they're walking up the trail, getting closer to the lion. And all of a sudden, just before they get to the lion's cage, what do they hear? Roar! <laughs> they hear the roar of the lion. And right away, as soon as they look, they say, that nobody has to tell them. There doesn't have to be a sign on the cage. Nobody has to tell them what it is. That's the lion. That's the lion. I said, that's what tonight was. If a kid came, if a person came to a fight, if a, if a person never been to a fight before, and this was the first fight they ever, ever went to, and on their way to the fight, they said to their friend, what does a fighter look like? They didn't have to have any other explanation other than, to get there, look in the ring, see Mickey Ward, and then say, that's a fighter. That's a lion. And that, that's, that's exactly what I saw when I was watching Serrano and Cruz. You, you saw the way that Cruz just kept coming out with the blood pouring out and just kept going, kept going, no matter what she was getting, hit, hit by a good puncher, a clean puncher in Serrano. She just kept coming, kept coming. That's a fighter. If you've never seen a fighter before, man. And again, getting back to my point, it's not about black or white. It's not about female or male. It's about a fighter. It's about a human being. It's about humanity. It's about a person. That's, that's what, it comes, that's the, what it comes down to. At the end of the day, that's what we're left with. At the end of the day, and that's what's great about boxing. It brings us right down to what matters. How you behave shows who you are, who you want to be, who you demand to be, who you say you are by the way you behave, the way you act when that moment comes. Oh my goodness. It was terrific. It was terrific on both sides. And again, it brought back it brought back those rivalry fights between, between the, you know, Mexico, the Mexican fighters are so known for the tradition of boxing, so known for their tradition, the, the heritage the, of, of the history of great fighters in Mexico. And Puerto Rico, the same thing. That little island has had so many great, I was blessed enough to train one of them. I think maybe the best one ever, Wilfredo Benitez. Benitez. The, maybe the greatest one ever. For me, there was a lot of great ones. Carlos Ortiz, if you go back far enough, yeah, just a lot of great ones. But obviously, for me, I trained them. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to, well, I am. I'm going to pick Benitez. But that little island has had so many great, great fighters. And Mexico with its great tradition. This was one of those rivalry fights. You know, Puerto Rico against Mexico. But again, it came down to just two fighters, and it couldn't have it couldn't have been better. Um, as far as breaking down the f fight early on, Cruz won the early rounds just by coming forward, outworking Serrano. To your point, she had a head down. She was winging. She was winging, and she was she was winning rounds for me. She was she was out working Serrano, and Serrano obliged her. She you know she doesn't run from a fight. You know, she she uh she fought the kind of fight that Cruz was looking for. She engaged her. She stayed right there and she engaged her. But then around the fourth round, Serrano made a change. She made an adjustment. And that's why she's obviously where she is. She made an adjustment and she stepped out of range. Again, the commentators didn't really talk about this, but I, I, 
I want to give him credit for this. Serrano, we know she's tough. We know she's a good puncher. She, we know she's strong. But she made a little adjustment. She stepped out of range a bit. She was smart. And she started timing Cruz as she came in. And that changed the flow of the fight. Very much like the Pedraza, what I was talking about earlier, you know, with the Pedraza, um, who, who did Pedraza? Um, Barbosa. Uh, Barbosa fight. Very similar. She, where Barbosa was controlling the outside and catching Pedraza on the way in. All of a sudden, Serrano gets outside a little bit, and now all of a sudden, she's able, as I said, change the flow of the fight, disrupt the rhythm that Cruz was in, and it gave Serrano the edge where she could pot shot Cruz before she got close enough to catch her, before she got up the hill. And Serrano began to place her shots really well, Ken. Really nice, solid, hard, clean, good shots. And both to the head and to the body. Oh, she placed some hellacious punches to the body. That's another reason why I say how tough Cruz was. The, the, forget about the ones there. We saw the blood. We saw all that. But the body shots that she endured, that she walked through, was, was really pretty incredible. Um, well, Cruz, and Cruz was throwing the larger amounts of punches. Serrano was doing an excellent job of just really intelligently and calmly placing shots. Beautiful shots. A head class caused Cruz to have her vision impaired. We talked about that. That was a shame. That came from both fighters coming together with their head, um, the cut on her head. But it didn't deter her, not at all, because she had a mission. Cruz had a mission of coming forward and just bringing hell and fury. And she brought hell and fury all night long. Uh, I, I got a kick out of it, Ken. She basically told her corner to get out of the way and let her fight. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the poor thing. Nobody pointed this out, but I see everything. The poor thing can, the her corner person, put in corner man, put her mouthpiece in at one point, upside down, and nobody <laughs> pointed it out. I saw it. She had to. She had to take it out with her glove, with blood all over her glove. She had to take it out with her glove and then replace it and put it in correctly. But that didn't matter because she was there for one thing, to fight, to fight, and to find a way. And, and blood wasn't going to stop her. Body shots weren't going to stop her. A mouthpiece wasn't going to stop her. <laughs> Nothing was going to stop her from doing and Serrano, at the end of the day, I applaud them both. Serrano, as I said, she she did a magnificent job making that little adjustment around the fourth round where she stood out of range. Just 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 enough. Just enough um to give herself an edge, which she took advantage of and and did a tremendous job. Tremendous job uh placing those shot. Great fight, great respect from me to both of these women warriors. Uh, and what I'll finish with, what impressed me most, Ken, and there was a lot to be impressed with, but it was, it was the incredible, we, we saw the incredible heart, you know, obviously, uh, as Cruz, uh, of Cruz, of both fighters, but of Cruz in particular, what she was dealing with. But what really impressed me the most with Cruz was her demeanor. It never altered. It, it, never, it never altered at all from the first round to the last round with blood and everything that was going around. She, she, stayed, she stayed the same. I mean, that, really, think about what I'm saying. Her demeanor, she was stoic. She was stone cold, matter of fact, let's go, next round, get out of my way, <laughs> let me move forward. Um, blood, bricks could have been coming at her. It, it, <laughs> it, it didn't matter. 
<laughs> you know, just give me the mouthpiece. I'll put it in the right way. <laughs> Push the blood out of my eyes and let me go. <laughs> I was impressed. I was impressed. Well, Teddy, before we jump over to the UFC quickly and touch on the Derek Lewis fight, I want to give a shout out to our friends at Athletic Greens. These guys have been with us from the beginning. I hope this you got my- it back the way for Tokyo because I know, I know, I know there may be certain things you might forget in your travel uh, to Tokyo in your suitcase. But I know there's one thing, you'll probably forget underwear, but there's one <laughs> thing, and, uh, but you won't forget, there's two things you won't forget. You won't forget socks because all runners, great runners, you're a great runner, need socks. And you won't forget your track shoes, but you sure as hell won't forget that thing in your right hand right there. That's the truth. I don't travel anywhere without athletic greens. And luckily for our listeners, you can get 10 free travel packs with your first purchase of Athletic Greens. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash atlas, they'll send you 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. And again, the travel packs are invaluable. This is my one go-to supplement. This is the one thing that if I had nothing else, this is the one supplement I'll take. It's an all-in-one green drink first thing in the morning. It tastes great. Mix it with a scoop of 8 to 10 ounces of water. Shake it up. They even send the shaker with it. So you don't have to think about anything. Tastes good, easy to use, and it's got 75 whole food sourced ingredients. They got you covered. It's the one thing that even when you're eating the healthiest diet, you got to make sure you're getting all your vitamins, nutrients, minerals, probiotics, prebiotics. They got you covered. Athleticgreens.com slash Atlas. 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Not only that, but they've been a great sponsor to the show. And if you're thinking about trying it, please use our code it helps us out a lot with the sponsors and that helps us add to the production value of the show and pay for the great resources like Sam Rivera Films on the other end with Teddy every week in uh, Staten Island and of course producer extraordinaire Rob Moore that guy doesn't come cheap Um, athleticgreens.com guys please check them out Teddy let's talk UFC Derek Lewis I love love Derek Lewis but I think what we realize in these fights especially recently with Derek is in the early days he could just muscle his way up with some of these guys when they take him down. But these, this sport continues to evolve. And if you don't have all your bases covered in the UFC, you're just not going to get wins. He always has the bigger racer. So there's always a threat that he can knock someone out. But God, every time someone gets a hold of him and gets him on the ground, it's it's the beginning of the end. And that's what uh, Sergey Spivak did to him. First round, just one-sided, complete beatdown. He just let er- took er- Derek down. Derek would muscle his way up with not much technique, all strength. And then Spivak would just take him right back down, drain him of all his energy, ground and pounded him. And uh, great win for Spivak. Good personality. Seems to be an exciting guy. Curious to see what comes next for him. He's definitely climbing the ranks. But what'd you think? How'd you see this from Derek? I'm still tired. Three o'clock in the morning to start. Oh, that's another thing. I got to assume because no, no, of the no, Asian, I, the heavy Asian influence, the main card starts at 1 a.m. The one thing I'll say, Teddy, is the U.S. is always accommodated. So our British fans always get get the fights. Super what about accommodating late, so me? Prob- what about accommodating <laughs> me? Three o'clock in the morning, Ken. <laughs> I, listen. I wasn't happy with it. I had to watch it in the morning. I cannot but stay I stayed up that up. late. I was stupid enough. I know you did. Stupid crazy. enough, crazy enough, dedicated enough maybe um, <laughs> to stay up with my man, Brennan Wood. My man, Brennan Wood. You know, part of my great, great Twitter team. Um, but well, and they're all great. Rob Moore, you know, Ian Mackey, but Brennan. Brennan was, he was as crazy and wacky and dedicated as I was. He stayed up with me. God bless him. And three o'clock in the freaking morning, three o'clock in the <laughs> morning, we stayed up and we tweeted. I don't know. I I want to meet the person that actually got one of my tweets that was actually up at three in the morning and received one of my, I'd like to meet that person. I know. I I'd read like them to, all in I'd the like morning. I'd like to, I like to shake hands with that person. I like to take that person out to a nice steak dinner, okay? Really, with me, with me and Brennan, I, I, I would love to do that. Um, look, all joking aside, uh, it was to wait up to three in the morning and then have it go about two minutes 
Ha, that was a little rough. That was a little rough. Like, I waited up for this. I waited up for this. But you know what? I knew what I was waiting up for because I actually, I actually tweeted, me and Brennan, but I actually put out there a tweet that, you know, obviously I thought it was a good one. I just said, don't go to the refrigerator, you know, don't go to the refrigerator. I, I had to do this tweet a little different being that it was three in the morning. I said, Ken, don't go to the refrigerator or to bed because you might miss this. That's how quick it's going to be. So, and sure enough, uh, if you went to the refrigerator or if you closed your eyes for a second, you missed it because it, it didn't last too long. But here's the breakdown because there's always a breakdown to it. Yeah, he reminds me, Lewis reminds me of the parallel to his, his twin to a certain extent in my world, in the boxing world, would be Devontae Wilder a little bit, where Wilder never developed really a lot of the technique he should have developed. He had that one thing, the great, great, great eraser of power in his right hand. He had that. And Lewis had the same thing. That great eraser of power in the right hand. So there's similar. But he never bothered to really develop his technique in other areas. Even in the striking area, much less grappling or jujitsu or anything on the as far as the you know the arts of, of MMA on the floor. He 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 just never really worked at developing any any of those skills. But people loved him. People stayed up like me to three in the morning because he did have that eraser that there is a chance that he could land it the way that the way that he landed uh, against Blades. Now the difference with Blades, Blades was great on the floor, great wrestling. Blades was gonna look to get get him to the floor the same way as Spivak was gonna look to get him to the floor. You know when you got him to the floor, you you probably got him. You probably got him. But when Blades went to get him to the floor what did Lewis do? He timed an uppercut beautifully, beautifully, because Blades, he, he telegraphed it. He telegraphed that he was coming forward a, a, light, a lot like Ben Askren did uh, against Masvidal. You know, where he telegraphed he was coming and Masvidal was able to be prepared. He watched videotape, he was ready for it, and he was ready for that flying knee. Well, same thing here. Lewis had obviously watched tape of Blades going for the going, you know, for the shoot to take his legs to go to the mat, and he knew that he was going to do that because that's where he has the advantage. And he caught him with the uppercut. Wasn't going to be with Spivak, and it wasn't going to be with Spivak because you know what? He didn't get enough credit for Spivak. Yeah, we know he's a great grappler. We know he's a great wrestler. We know, and he showed that. He showed that, and he's relentless there. But he's improved his striking game enough, enough where he had a good jab and that jab was able, and I tweeted this too. Not that I'm an MMA expert, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm a fight expert, not an MMA. I get it when it gets to the floor and all that, but I appreciate the art of fighting in whatever form it is. I appreciate it. I know what it takes and I had even tweeted that I thought that a key early on in the first round was for Spivak to use the jab just to control range, just to keep separation so that Lewis couldn't get his hands on him, that Lewis, that Lewis couldn't get his, his fist on him, to, keep, to make Lewis make a mistake, to keep enough, just, just keep enough range where he didn't get caught with one of those big, you know, haymakers that Lewis can catch you with. Use the jab, keep separation, and create enough space. You know that old saying, Ken, give the guy enough rope here, hang himself. Well, mm -hmm. that's how you go about fighting Lewis. Give him enough rope, he's going to hang himself. Create enough space, control him enough. He's going to, he's probably going to make a mistake where he's going to reach in, he's going to leave himself open for a counter punch, or in this case, to grab him safely where you could take him to the mat. And that's what happened. He used the jab early on. He kept space, Spivak, really well. And then finally, when it came the right time, when Lewis got 
when he got close enough to lose safely without leaving himself vulnerable to one of those bombs, he wrapped his hands around Lewis and it was all over. It was basically over because then he took him to the floor. And like you said, Ken, he, you know, he, he was moving him around, pick him up, putting him back down, you know, on the floor. Lewis was trying, but he's, he's out of his element. It's like a fish out of water. He, he's, he doesn't know that stuff. He doesn't know the grappling. He's, he's, you know, his strength means nothing. His power punching means nothing when he's reduced to that place. And he was reduced to that place, to Spivak's place, where Spivak was the man, where he was the boss. And once Spivak got him there, he was two things. He was relentless and he was smart. He, was, he, knew, he knew how to position himself. He, he was all over him, and, and he didn't stop. He kept the motor going. He, he kept going fast, moving him, moving him around, and moving his body, positioning himself until finally he got the position, Spivak that is, that he needed, that he wanted, where he could get the hold that he needed for the submission, and he did. And he went about it methodically, um, fast but methodically, um, smartly, you know, like I said, relentless but smart, and and he he got what he wanted. Like I tweeted, I said, "There's the mistake." He he was he was waiting for the one mistake for Lewis to make to give him the geography that he needed to dominate, and that's what it's about geography. And that's exactly, it's geography in a war. You want to fight the battle in a place where it suits you. It suits your, your troops, your strengths, the artillery that you have, that it suits you. And it's the same thing here in fighting. You want to get to geography that suits you and your talents, your abilities. And sure enough, he, he uses jab. Then all of a sudden, Lewis makes a mistake. Smithick gets the geography he needs in tight, takes him to the floor, and uh, like they say, that was all she wrote. Yep, that's it. That's a pretty good summary there. Quick shout out to our guys at MyBookie. Check them out at MyBookie.ag. Use the promo code ATLAS for a 50% credit on your first deposit. UFC 284 coming up. Makachev versus Volkanovski. Islam Makachev minus 400, Volk plus 300. Who you like? That's a tough one. Those odds are crazy. I thought it would be closer to 50 50. But check them out at MyBookie, mybookie.ag. Use the promo code Atlas for 50% credit on your first deposit. Well, that's a wrap for all the fights we had covered. The one thing that I just wanted to mention I saw announced this morning, the fight everyone's been waiting for. Thank God they finally got it done. Credit to Eddie Hearn and Matchroom. AJ, Anthony Joshua, he's getting the fight everyone's been waiting for. Jermaine Franklin. Jermaine Franklin, who lost to uh, Dillian White, who's been knocked out by um, Anthony Joshua, uh, Alex Pavetkin, Tyson Fury. Uh, <laughs> I just don't. I just don't know where they're going with this one, Anthony who, Joshua. Who, who, Mark. <laughs> well, Joshua's been knocked out. You said by those guys. No, uh, no, no. Uh, uh, by who? Uh, Dill no, Dillian saying. White's been knocked out by oh, all Dillian those White. guys, you, and he beat. No, no, you and he threw beat me off. Franklin you threw me off. You said, I thought you said Franklin, so you threw me off. All right. No, sorry. Yeah, Franklin, who's who lost to Dillian White. Dillian White, who's been already knocked out by Joshua and uh, and Pavetkin and Fury. He beat Jermaine Taylor, majority decision, uh, relatively close fight but uh, a fight that absolutely no one was looking for Anthony Joshua against Jermaine Taylor I mean come on what happened to Joe Joyce what about Tyson Fury what about Deontay Wilder uh, what about Andy Ruiz what about anyone no this when you story. started you threw me off I thought you were talking yeah. about Frank yeah no we knew this was coming Day and White and um, Day and White is fighting the rematch as you said uh, he gets listen he, he, he it's great being a fighter open across the pond it really is you get paid if, if you become one of those guys you become a millionaire and you don't have to win your fights you can lose your fights they, the great great British audience will come out and they will 
They will back you. They love you. They will come. I mean, here's a guy, Dean White. Uh, who Teddy, used- no, no, J- Fr- Jermaine Franklin, Teddy. He's getting AJ. Have you even heard? I like. I vaguely. Oh no! Even wait, wait. You told me off, Ken, 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 yeah. Ken, Ken. You're you're mixing the crap out of me. Oh, oh is <laughs> Dean is Dean Jermaine White Jermaine Taylor fighting? and Anthony Joshua are fighting. I was just saying that Jermaine wait, Taylor, Jermaine wait, wait. Franklin lost right. to Dillian White. Now you said Jermaine Taylor. You got me really screwed up over here. <laughs> Jermaine All right, so, Franklin. So it's a rematch of that fight. It's Jermaine Franklin. No, getting his first shot against Anthony Joshua. All right, so Jermaine Franklin, Franklin. Franklin lost, and he's getting a tie. So when you lose, you get a fight. All right, listen. <laughs> I I got it. You you confused me with the names. Sorry here. about All that. Right. No no no. I it's I got to listen better. But listen, th- originally they were talking about. Originally, they were talking about Joshua fighting a rematch with White. Of course, he had knocked out White some years ago, and White was only one fight removed from being knocked out by Fury in a abysmal, abysmal display. I mean, he wasn't prepared. He wasn't prepared to fight the right fight at all, and he got destroyed by Fury, got finished with the uppercut, uh, and then Dillian White comes back, gets on the winning track, fights Franklin, from the United States, Franklin was undefeated. Franklin beats, uh, Franklin loses to Dan White in a competitive fight. Uh, he was hurt badly at the end of the fight, very badly. But he also hurt Dan White a couple times in that fight pretty badly too. It was a very competitive fight. Um, Franklin hadn't really been in with anybody, and then he stepped up with you know with with White, uh, and and he. You know he made a hell of a he 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 made a hell of a showing of himself, but here's the crazy thing about across the pond and about boxing in general, you usually you don't get rewarded for losing, you know what I mean? You usually don't get rewarded, but you do if you're fighting the machine. Now listen to me, this is it. If you're fighting the power's fighter, the power. You know, Eddie Hearn's the power over there. You know, Warren's the power over there. PBC with Heyman is the power over here. Bob Arum with ESPN and Top Rank, they're the power over here. Whole, um, uh, what's his name? Is hanging on by his string is still the power over De here. De La Hoya. Uh, De La Hoya. You know, that he, as long as he keeps Ryan Garcia and a couple guys, right? His, his, they're the power. Now, that's boxing. That's why we need a national commission. Because one of the reasons, one of the many, because as long as you're with the power, you're going to get taken care of. So Joshua, he's the darling over there. Even though, you know, even though he's lost two fights in a row to, to a smaller man, Usyk, a great man, a great man. A smaller as far as size, but not smaller any other area. Not any other area. I mean, Usyk was maybe the, one of the greatest cruiserweight champs of all time, solidified all his titles like Holyfield did. Um, he's the only guy I could think of other than Holyfield as being that kind of cruiserweight champion, the greatest of all time, him and Holyfield. And then he's an Olympic gold medalist. Um, he's undefeated. He's a great man. He, he's got a terrible situation going on in his home country in the Ukraine. He's over there supporting his country, and, and he's got... He's got one of the belts. Uh, and like he beat Joshua twice, back to back, in London, in Joshua's, you know, home. So Joshua lost to a good man, but he did lose twice in a row to the smaller man. He did get knocked out by Ruiz, who really hasn't been tearing it up since. You know what He's I mean? He's lost three has, of his last five, Joshua. Uh, oh, there it is. Uh, uh, no, I'm talking about right now Ruiz. He, then he yeah. goes, he gets knocked out by Ruiz. Ruiz hasn't been tearing it up. Uh, by he, he immediately lost the title back to Joshua. And I give Joshua credit for doing that. Here's the bottom line. Joshua is one of the darlings over across the pond, just like you have some anywhere. Of course, he's a darling. He's with the power. He's with Eddie Hearn. And you know what? They're going to give him what he wants because he's going to fill a stadium and they're going to do it with as little risk as possible. They're going to do it with someone they can sell it. Franklin made a good performance across the pond uh, against White. So people know him now. They know he's a game kid. They know that, that he hurt White. 
You know, they know he survived the last round. He showed heart. You know, he'll make it. He'll make a showing of himself. He'll make a showing of And you know what? Who knows against Joshua? Joshua doesn't exactly have a granite chin. You know what I mean? Uh, and Or granite confidence right now after losing the last two to, to music. So you never know. You never know. And, and you got to figure that Franklin's confidence is only going to grow off his last outing when he stepped up and he found out, hey, I could step up. I could step up to the you know, the higher altitudes here in boxing, and I could be okay. And that's important for a fighter to find out. So, so I have that going for him. Listen, is it a fight that I would mark off on my calendar? No. <laughs> Even if I lived across the pond, I wouldn't mark it off. <laughs> I wouldn't because I'm not interested in backing a guy who's lost his last two, who's lost how many out of his last, what did you just say? What Joshua guys? lost three of his last fights. He beat Ruiz in the rematch. No, no, and he not, beat not his last fights. His last, how many fights? His last in the five la fights? In his last five fights, he's okay, lost last, three of them. He's lost three of his last fights. All right, look. I'm, I know that he's an amiable guy. I know that he was a gold medalist from the Olympics. I caught his fight in London against the Italian. He lost. He lost. But there was no way he wasn't going to get the gold medal with the Olympics being in London. He lost. But he got it. Okay. Listen, people are going to say, oh, Teddy, you're knocking Joshua. You're knocking. No, I'm pointing things out. I, I give him all the credit. He, 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 he's in a difficult sport. He became world champion. He's made millions and millions and millions of dollars. But I'll be damned if I'm not going to point out that he's also taken care of. Better than 90% of the fighters will ever be taken care of. That, that he, he's also, you know, protected. That he's, he's also favored, you know, uh, in, in a way where a lot of fighters would not be given this fight against this guy on his platform to make another $20 million or whatever the hell he's going to bring. It's probably somewhere in that neighborhood. They're going to fill out any stadium that they put in because that's what the English do. They come out. They come out and they support their, and God bless them. God bless them. If I come back in another lifetime, I, come, I want to come back as a heavyweight from London. That's 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 what I want to come back. I better change my name though, because uh, the English fans will remember this, and they they say, "Oh no, you are a nice to our you to our bloke. You are a nice to our bloke, uh, Mr. Joshua. You are a nice to Joshua." Uh, hey, yes, I am. I just told you. I respect him. I respect that he gets in that chamber of truth. Uh, one of the most difficult things to do in the world that he gets in there. And that he that he does he faces another man, uh, which is very difficult to do, uh, in in a in a squared circle. That he faces his fears, his inhibitions, all of those things, the dangers that are inherent in this sport. Yeah, I respect all of that, but I also I'm honest. I point out, I point out that he again is treated much better than most fighters, and and given privileges that most fighters would never be given if he wasn't in a position he's in over there and he makes money so of course they're gonna do it Eddie Hearn's smart he does a hell of a job over there and, and he's gonna make more money with him of course and they should because they they built this thing up they believed in it they worked at it they nurtured it and now they're getting the dividends of it good but Am I, I'll be damned if I'm going to be sitting around saying I can't wait to see a Joshua uh, uh, against Franklin, uh, <laughs> even with some very uh, good crumpets to have and enjoy with a spot of tea uh, before, mate. No, I'm not. But having said that, um, I want to I wanna say one other thing that, I, you know how Dana White gives out those $50,000 bonuses, which yep. I think is great. Knockout of the night, fight of the night, submission of the night. I wish promoters in boxing would do the same thing. I'm not, I'm not trying to spend anyone's money. I'm just saying I wish. But anyway, Dana White does that. I think it's, I think it's great. I know people are going to say, oh, yeah, he doesn't pay millions of dollars more than that. 
listen, there's plenty of millionaires that are in the UFC now. There's plenty of them. And, and they're just like boxing. They're, there's guys that at this level that of being able to make money and guys that aren't quite at that level or near that level. We get it. We understand. But I like, I do like that he gives that $50,000 to the fight of the night. I just wanted to kind of throw a hat in the ring for staying up to 3.30 in the morning watching the other night <laughs> to think that maybe me and Brennan could be eligible for that 50K bonus uh, just for staying up to... Uh, <laughs> Tweet, tweeter just, of the night. Just for being tweeter of the night at 3.30. Maybe. <laughs> just I figured, let me throw it out there. Uh, that's all. Listen. Yep. God bless everybody. Um, that's, that's, that's take... Let's take some, we had a lot of fun today. We discussed a lot of fights. We discussed a lot of things. We discussed a lot of life. That, let's take away from that the, the one message that I think came through uh, throughout the fights, throughout these great warriors that we were describing, the women, the men, uh, their behavior. Let's get better with our behavior as, as people, as human beings. That, let's try to be champions in, in those areas. I couldn't God agree bless. more. And with that, everyone have a great week. We'll be back to discuss an incredible fight card coming up on the UFC. Our man Volkanovski in action. Um, that's going to be a great oh, fight. And we'll oh, be here to break he's it all down. <laughs> yeah, oh, we'll be here and to he's break fighting. it all down. He's got his hands full. He's got his hands full. He's got his hands full. It's gonna be that's gonna yeah. be a rough one, Ken. That's Islam gonna be a rough Makachev, one. Hell but, of a fight. but but one guy, I'm not saying I could go against Mark Makachev. I can't. But I can't go against Volkanovski either because the guy's subhuman. He finds that's a way. Right. He they should call him the zombie because he's like <laughs> he's like out like dead like a zombie and he comes to life. I mean, but that's it. oh, it's gonna be interesting. It's gonna be rough, but it's gonna Give be us interesting. something to look forward to all week. So with that, guys. Thanks for being with us. Appreciate you guys. Please subscribe to the show. And we'll be back mon next Monday to talk about everything and post it up on Tuesday. Look for the show uh, week from today. Thanks for being with us. Appreciate you guys.